<laughs> yes. I love the song, I Fly. I uh, was a, a superhero fan, well, I still am. Superhero fan, superhero fans in the room. Anybody like to, uh, yeah. Yeah, anybody like to fly? Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Put on a cape. I have a few capes at home, just saying. <laughs> and th today, what I really want to introduce to you is like the coolest, most amazing superhero thing that you already have. The coolest, most amazing superhero thing that you already have. I know. What is it? Curiosity. That's it. Curiosity. I don't. Okay. Well, how? How can curiosity be the most amazing thing that we have as a superhero? The superhero in our own life, we're all going on this life journey. You are a superhero. You are taking the mantle of that experience of the hero's journey and literally living it out as your life. And one of the beautiful things that helps during this navigation of life is curiosity. And the first way, I have three ways that curiosity helps. One is curiosity as a way of knowing. So when I was a little kid, I really wanted to know more about life and I'm not going to do the, the parents question thing. That is not where I was going. But I knew somebody was thinking that. <laughs> but it was more about like, huh, when I go outside, I wonder what's under that rock. And I'd turn the rocks over. Now, I lived in New Mexico, so we would have like centipedes and millipedes and vinegaroons and all kinds of cool critters. Ants, big fire ants. Yeah, and then, and I had this bug jar. I like to, I like to go catch bugs. Now, I didn't catch the, the centipedes and the vinegarons. I didn't catch those guys, but I did catch critters, like ladybugs. I wanted to catch butterflies. I never caught any butterflies, but you know, I tried. I caught other things in my little bug jar. I got little baby lizards, horny toads, desert. You, you, you have like, um, what are they, like salamanders? Slugs! I could have caught slugs! <laughs> See what you're missing out, people from New Mexico? Gosh. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I picked them up here. I usually save them on my walks when I'm walking. I'm like, no, let me take you to the other side. Okay, we're good, now we can continue walking. Ask my wife, she knows. Um, <laughs> but I was so curious, I wanted to know, what, what is this world? There was like animal prints. What animal is that? Let me follow the prints. I never found out, but at least I joined the Girl Scouts so I could find out, you know, what, who made what prints. And that was always an interesting, you know, revelation. It's like, oh, wow, those are deer prints and those are raccoon prints and those are bobcat prints. And, you know, it was always so interesting. And for me, the world was such an interesting place to explore. And I had this sense of inherent curiosity. And it was a way for me to discover the world. It was a way for me to discover what is out there. But I also lost some of that, a lot of that, when I became an adult. Like, what happened to that, that you know, oh, what is that? You know, I saw, I saw a kid pointing to the, the flowers on the tree the other day. It's like, you know, whoa, the whole tree is blooming. And then here we are, like, walking through life, and there's, like, hundreds of trees blooming. It's like, are you paying attention? Are you curious? Napoleon Hill wrote this book called Think and Grow Rich. And what I love about Napoleon Hill is, um, so this book was written in 1937, and it's still one of the best sellers for self-help books. And actually here in, in when we, at Centers for Spiritual Living, we teach the principles that he talks about in this book. 
they're, they're so fundamental that it's like, I would say it's common knowledge, but common knowledge isn't really common, just so you know, it's just, but the, what he was like, he was so curious because all of these people, he, he, like Henry Ford and Thomas Edison and Andrew Carnegie, he was so curious about why they did so well in life. What was special about them? What made them so successful? And so for 20 years, he studied the most wealthy, successful people in the world. What made them tick? What, what is this? Is it something that could be learned? Or is it just who they are? Is it something that we can imitate and do and then also have that same result? And what he found out is, yes, there is. But it was his inherent curiosity that he studied these people for 20 years. What makes them wealthy? And you know what? He became incredibly wealthy in this book uh, because of the book. But it's, even this book says more than 7 million readers have, wanted, have made this book one of the greatest bestsellers of all time. And what did he do? He was curious. Do you want to be wealthy? Study wealthy people. Surround yourself by wealthy people. You want to have a spiritual experience? You want to connect with your God? Find the spiritual people in the world. Hang out with them. Do as they do. That's what Jesus was saying. He's like, do as I do. He's like, I'm pretty connected with, you know, the infinite. He's like, he didn't mean like, you have to worship me. He was like, do the things that I'm doing. (laughs) <laughs> the way, that's the way. Follow the way. Don't necessarily follow me. It's not because of me. The way is available to everybody. But do what I'm doing. And that's what Napoleon Hill was saying. He was like, hey, I figured it out. I got the secret. <laughs> and it was very interesting because he wrote... Curiosity is one of the permanent and certain characteristics of a vigorous intellect. Now, we have studied the intellect a lot. Science of mind is kind of like what we would call our, our Bible, if we were to have a Bible, except it's a book that's on philosophy and theology and it's a little science, a little bit of everything. Ernest Holmes called it the science of mind but it was studying how do our thoughts make an impact? What, what are our belief systems? What, are they, what, what, what kind of impact in our life do our beliefs have? And that's what Ernest Holmes was studying. And he did a lot of the study of the science of mind. But mind was also a synonym for God or the divine or the infinite. He said it was the one mind, like we all exist in the one lot mind, like we're all... I wanted to say in a soup of mind, but then we would have to be like maybe a bean and a carrot and a, you know, we're all in this infinite soup. (laughs) And and we're, we're, we're in it and it's available to us and we can just say yes. Say what, what do I need to know? What can I, what, what is it? What is the right and perfect path for me? And, and inherent in the question is the answer. It may not come right away, but it's kind of like the oak, the acorn. The the whole oak tree is in the acorn. The whole oak tree. I mean, it's kind of like mind-boggling. You see the big oak trees around there, and they have lots of acorns hanging out off of them. One little acorn has all of that. But the same thing is true for questions. Inherent in the question is the answer. All you have to do is ask the question. That's the superpower, because the universe already has the answer. So all you have to do is ask. Buddha was one of the most curious people. He was born Siddhartha Gautama. And he, he was this prince. He was a royal prince. He was in India. He had everything. Everything that people, I would say, kind of like the everyday person wishes they had. He had all the wealth, he had all the power, he had all of the, anything he wanted to know he had access to. 
He had all of the people who could give him whatever he wanted. And yet, in that, he was not happy. And he said, what if there's something more to this thing called life? What if there's something beyond that? What if it's not about all of this stuff? What if there's something greater for me to experience? And he felt a call to, to leave it all behind and to find what that was. He, it was an internal urging, but he asked those questions. What else is possible? What, what, you know, what, uh, I feel like I'm not happy here, but I wonder if true connection is possible, if true happiness. So he left everything, all the wealth. He went, he went with what he would have called the common people. He was hanging out with the everyday person, talking with them, asking them questions, figuring things out, and finally he just was like, I give up, I'm just gonna sit underneath this tree, I'm just gonna ask the question and wait until the answer comes. And he did. And it came. What if that's all you have to do though is ask the question and the answer will come? So the first thing, curiosity as a way of knowing. The second thing, is curiosity as a way of loving. Now, that is the other great superpower in the universe, I feel, is the power of love. I believe that love is more powerful than hatred. Love is more powerful than any other thing that is happening out there. That everything can be solved with love. But what if we wanted to be that expression of love? What if we wanted to be where love showed up in the world? What would that look like? I read this study that said the best relationships, and this is, I mean, I don't mean like it could be intimate, but I mean it's friendships and people you just meet. The best relationships are when one person is incredibly curious about the other person and then it's reciprocated. So there's, there's a curiosity there. It's like when I ask you who you are and I wanna know about your history and I wanna know where you came from and I wanna know what's on your heart and I wanna know what's on your mind and I wanna know why you believe the way you do, my heart opens up because I get to see you for who you are. Has anybody had that experience where, where somebody's just asked them questions about who they are and listened intently? And they didn't listen to respond, they just listened. We just did a, a, a four day retreat with the Prac 2 students who are like inches away from becoming <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> inches. And this is one of the main things that we teach practitioners. This is one of the most powerful things. If you want to be a place where love shows up, curiosity is the answer. The most empathic and empathetic people are curious. Empathy is a form of love that is expressed by curiosity. So can you imagine what kind of world this would be if we had people who had different perspectives, which we do, but instead of me trying to defend my perspective, I want to find out more about your perspective. What kind of world would this be if we were curious about each other? I love this teaching because I have the ability to study all these different religions. You know, I started, I grew up Methodist, and while I love the Methodist teaching, which is Christian, I love Christianity because I dig Jesus. I think he's really cool, and he really knew what love meant in the world. The, the philosophy or the organization that I, the particular one that I grew up in, to me, was an incomplete alignment with his teachings because there was this whole thing about gay is not okay 
and the whole Methodist church split in two. <laughs> two. They have the, the people, the Methodists that are like, uh, Jesus was talking about like love, everybody, and everybody's an aspect of the divine. And then there's this whole other aspect of the church that was like, you're going to hell because you're gay. And I was in the, you're going to hell because you're gay place. Um, and I'm gay, <laughs> by the way. Um, and, but it, I didn't know that at the time. I actually left that, that teaching because they were teaching of God being judgmental. And I truly believe that that's human trying to make themselves into God by judging. They think, oh, okay, I'm, I'm almighty and I'm all-knowing so I can judge you. When the truth is, when we're more like God, we don't judge. We're actually in a place where love shows up. Yeah. 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 And that's the kind of place I wanted to be at. And then I started studying these different religions. I started studying Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism. And I was like, oh my God, they're all teaching these different things. And it's like they're saying something about the one thing. And if there was just a place that taught that thing, I would go there. <laughs> Too bad there's not. <laughs> I didn't find this place until I was uh, 21. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> there's people who are like me who are going, what if there's a string of truth that runs through all these religions and they're teaching it? Oh my God. So that's where I found Center for Spiritual Living, which was amazing to me. And I, I, I love that aspect. But it reminds me of the Hindu story. It's like there's, there's each of these philosophies, I think, are talking about the same thing. And in the Hindu story, they have the story of these blind men. And they have this mystery animal that the blind men have to talk about. And so the first blind man, he goes to the mystery animal. He's like, oh, oh, oh. Well, it's kind of like a snake. And then the next blind man, he comes over and he, they, you know, puts his hands. Oh, well, it's, it's kind of like a fan. And then the next blind man comes up and he touches this thing and he's like, oh, it's like a, it's like a hard spear. And then another blind man says, oh, that's, it's like a tree trunk. And they were all describing the elephant. But they all had a different perspective about the one thing. Now that's us, we're like those blind men describing our own expression of the divine. And we all have our own perspective, but it's all part of the one. Now, if I talk to you about your perspective, I might get a bigger picture of what it is. I might get a bigger understanding of what this thing called life is. I might have an opening in my heart and just start seeing more of the picture of what's available. And when I do that, I start loving your perspective. I start loving you from where you're coming from because I see it's part of the one. So curiosity is a way of knowing. Curiosity as a way of loving. And the third one is curiosity as a way of being. So the first part is knowing is more of like a mental thing. Loving is like a heart thing. Being is a spiritual thing. What makes us aware of ourselves? How do we know who we are? I love Rumi. Rumi was a Persian poet, a scholar, a mystic. He was a Sufi, and a Sufi is a sect of Islam. And he was so curious about life and about God. He was so curious. He wanted to know what is in my heart, what is in my soul. 
how is this expression and experience of the divine loved and how do I love? What practices can I express in order to deepen that awareness? One of his, one of his quotes was, as you start to walk on the way, the way appears. Have you read the book, What's in the Way is the Way? What's in the way is the way, and as you start to walk on the way, the way appears. Have you ever thought you don't have to know all the steps to get to the end? You know, if you're driving at night, your headlights go like, I don't know, like 50 feet in front of you, and yet there's something in you that knows you're going to get to the destination but you don't have to have all the steps because there's something that does know all the steps. It's like God is our GPS, our God positioning system. <laughs> it knows where we are, it knows what we're seeking, and it knows how to get there. And what if we just needed to know the next steps? What if we just needed to know What's in front of us is the right and perfect thing. What I also love about the divine is that it's, all possibilities are available, which means that a win, 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 win is available. And whenever I have something stuck in front of me and I think that is the only thing that's possible, I say, what else is possible and how can it get any better than this? I learned that from my prayer partner. She's a minister. She likes to do access consciousness. Some of you know that. Um, I don't study access consciousness, but what she said is, when we ask the universe, what else is possible and how can it get any better than this? Because we think that our own perspective is the only way, then the universe opens up the other possibilities to us. It says, I'll show you what else is possible. And sometimes it's, you know, you need to have that conversation that sucks. <laughs> because you've been saying, I want to be in integrity, or I want to be a person who stands in their spiritual authority. And here, the universe gave you an opportunity to do that, and then you're pissed off about it. <laughs> Or, oh, I want to be the place where love shows up and something like not love shows up in your world and you're like, what the? <laughs> and the universe is like, how does love show up in the world? I just gave you the perfect opportunity to be love in this situation. It's those situations that are the, the, the challenging places that create the biggest opportunities for our spiritual awareness to occur. Rumi said, if you're irritated by every rub, how will you become polished? <laughs> I know, right? It's shiny. Yep, feeling a little shiny now. And I recognize and know that that's my opportunity in life because life isn't always peaches and cream. <laughs> life does those opportunities. Life gives times where we get to step into our spiritual magnificence. Sometimes I have to rise above the situation and go, what is the bigger picture here? My wife sometimes asks me, you know, in like five years, is this gonna mean anything? Like really? <laughs> Is it such a big deal? No. But maybe it is a big deal and it will mean something and the question is, how am I gonna walk through this situation so I can look back at myself and be proud of who I am? The opportunity is there. And if you don't know the way, you can just ask. You can say, what else is possible and how can it get any better than this? So I wonder, 
Have you ever asked the universe, what is my next step? Where shall I go? What, sh what is the perfect and right thing for me? Just because somebody else is doing something doesn't mean it's yours to do. But yours might be something else to do. There was one time I got called to go to this conference, and I just want you to know, I like to do things with people. I like to go with people. I'm a person who likes to go. I like to exercise with people. I like to go to movies with people. Some of you are really awesome. You do all of this stuff by yourself. I do not. I like to go places with people. And I got called to go to this conference when I, when I was a practitioner. It was the International New Thought Alliance Conference. And during this conference, which was held in Oakland, um, I, I didn't know why I got called, but I was like, I'm just gonna go to this conference. I don't know what this is about, but I'm feeling called. And I said, what is this about, God? What is this about, Spirit? And it just felt that call forward, kind of like uh, Buddha before he was Buddha, Siddhartha, right? <laughs> was, what is this about? But I showed up with curiosity. And it turned out to be a conference, which I had never attended, which was attended by like 99% ministers. <laughs> And I was a practitioner at the time. And I was so inspired by that conference. Like I was around spiritual gurus who were just like up and like left and right. They were just speaking out, like pro prophesizing and, and, and inspiring and motivating and moving and showing me who I am and awaken me to my greatest good. And I was just like getting it for right and left and I'm like, these people are so cool. I want to hang out with them forever. And that's when I got the call to be a minister. I was like, I can hang out with them forever. <laughs> Why, yes, I can. <laughs> and I was in my 20s at the time. I thought, I thought that's something for older people. <laughs> Ministry is not for young people. It's for people who've lived their whole lives, they've retired, and then they're going to be ministers. Like, that's what I thought. <laughs> but apparently that's not true. So I wonder, can you use your superpower? Can you inspire others by being curious about who they are? Can you step into the world of curiosity, of beingness, wondering about maybe a people who are different than you? What if you tried to do a new spiritual practice? What if you took on a new form of meditation? What if you studied some spiritual teacher that you never studied before? What if you got curious about the thing that you really want to experience in your life and you went and hung out with those kinds of people, those kinds of people, all those spiritual people? That's why I'm here, because I want to hang out with you. I want to be where all the luminaries are. I want to be in the place where everywhere I go, I'm inspired by what I see. I can tell you the 11 Prac 2 students, mind-blowingly awesome people. Like, mind-blowingly awesome. That's what we attract here. And that's where I want to hang out. So ask yourself, what can I express? What can I be? What's my calling? What more is there to life? What have I not discovered? What else is possible? How can it get any better than this? And if you ask those questions, perhaps we can all just put on our superhero capes and fly together. And so it is. Let's pray. All of those aspects of soaring, of flying, these are all symbols that mean something really deeply to me. The eagles, the ravens, the crows, the birds, the butterflies, the dragonflies, the angels. There's something about flying that's a reminder that anything is possible, that everything is possible.
That the infinite knower that knows my soul knows where my next step is. It knows what is the right and perfect actions for me to take in any situation. It knows what the highest and greatest good is for everybody involved. And so I continued to be drawn by the curiosity of my heart, by my soul. And I invite each and every person here to tune in to that, to tap into that curiosity, to awaken to that superpower that already is there so that truly we can be a combined force for good in the world and that we can soar like the eagles and be a place where love flies through the universe. It flies through all the places that are experiencing sadness, the places of war, the places of strife, the places where people have forgotten that we're part of one big human family, the places where there's been mass shootings. All of those places, I know and declare that I am a place where love shows up and that my love is contagious. And I know and claim that truly because we are here united in that consciousness that something is shifted, something is uplifted in all of those people who are struggling right now. And that is the infinite power of grace and love in form happening now on this planet. And so I'm grateful to accept this truth, to participate in this truth, to be this truth right here and right now, and to know that it expands and expresses from this moment on. And I am forever eternally grateful for that. And so it is. <laughs>